Still in chapter one. Again. Are we going all the way to verse 26? Sorry. We might get to verse 15 today. Don't overdo it. Here you go, last one. I'm going to start at verse 14 today. But let's start reading at verse 12 so we can pick up what Paul's, what Paul's coming from here. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Let's pray. God, this is your word. May we come to it this morning seeking you and your face, understanding that you have a purpose for all things that are written in Scripture that you are teaching us, encouraging us, exhorting us to live lives that are glorifying to you and to your Son. So we ask now that you would open our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may receive what you have for us this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. <laughs> Verse 14 is where we are picking up this morning, but just as a little bit of recap, last week we talked about Paul and his uh, going into a section here that we've entitled uh, The Opportunities of Obstacles. The Opportunities of Obstacles. And we talked last week about how Paul starts off telling the brethren in Philippi about his circumstances, but he doesn't uh, go into a, woe is me, I'm so depressed, I'm longing for all kinds of things, and I don't have that, and I'm being treated so unfairly. Now he starts right out with, with proclaiming how the gospel is advancing. And so we see here Paul's character in doing this, and how he's putting an example out for the Philippians that they should be this way too. And for us even today, when we get into circumstances, we should see them as opportunities. And we talked about how the example of the Israelites after they came out of Egypt and they saw the, the chariots coming down on top of them and how Moses said, don't, don't look at that. Stand by and watch how the Lord's going to save you through this and see that opportunity that God's going to portray his glory and show us his salvation for his people. So we want to do that this morning as well and as a body of believers here at First Southern. We want to see obstacles as opportunities. And we talked about whether or not this witness that he had given to the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else uh, while he was in captivity there, or imprisonment in Rome, was it successful? We looked at chapter 4, verse 22. Yes, it was. We answered that question. And then we kind of closed off the day by talking about how suffering, has suffering ever brought you closer to God? So, this morning, Paul's going to move from those in his immediate association, like we talked about last week, the Praetorian Guard, those that are like chained to him, and to everyone else, the servants and the household people who are in that place, as well as the, the clerical people and the judges and all that kind of stuff, those people who are right around him, to a larger group, to those outside, but nonetheless who have been affected by the circumstances that Paul is in. So we'll look at verse 14 this morning. Let's start there. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So we have a first group here that Paul points out in this verse. Who is that group? Who is the first group he points to? Guards. <clears throat> What's that? The guards. The guards? He pointed out the guards back in verse 13 with the Praetorian guard talking about them. Oh. In verse 14, and the most uh, and the most of believers. the most of the believers. Right, most of the believers, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord. Now, 
We can describe this group using this, this verse. We'll kind of break it down a little bit and look at the different ways this group is described. First of all, we can see that this group is many and that most of the brethren, so we have most, it's a large group. In fact, it's probably more than any of the other groups that Paul's going to point to here later in these verses. So it's a big group. And it's the brethren. Now, who are the brethren? Who are the brethren that he's talking to? The disciples. What's that? His disciples. The disciples? Yeah. So it's so is it saved or unsaved people? Saved. We call them saved, saved people, right? The believers, the fellow saints, the holy ones. And so this is the, the group they were saved and they were trusting in the Lord. Now, this is important to establish this here in verse 14, and we'll see why as we go through the lesson this time. So we have that there were many of them, and says, and most, that it was the brethren, those that were saved and trusting in the Lord. And that they were doing this because of my imprisonment. <coughs> you see there in verse 14. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. So this group was making a decision. They were making a decision to stand up no matter the consequences, and they were inspired by what to do this? Paul's example. Paul's example. And Paul's example in going through what? Prison. Prison. When he was in prison. So this group has decided, you know what? Paul is suffering for the faith, and this is an example for us. We should be this way too. Now, this doesn't just apply to the Philippians back in that day, does it? It applies to us today, right? We should see other Christians going through trials and tribulations, seeing them trust in God, seeing them have faith in what God's going to do through that, and then we get inspired to go along with that. That's part of the reason why we get together as a body of believers. He's talking about the Roman believers there, though, right? Is he talking about just the Roman believers? I mean, he said, you know, because they're doing it around him. You see his bravery, and they're coming in and mixing with him and, and sharing the gospel, too. Right. Right. And that is true. It's, it's probably pointed, uh, I wouldn't say just to the Roman believers, but right. it's, it's going to be all of those who are hearing about Paul's imprisonment. And now it could be even the Philippians, right? Right. as they hear about his imprisonment as well. So there, there are many of them. It's the brethren. They're doing it because of the imprisonment, the example that Paul's set for them. And also out of this, they have more courage to speak the word of God. Now, it, here's an interesting point, and maybe... Maybe you didn't put these two together, but I want you to see the cause and the effect, or the cause and the result of what's going on here. Paul's in prison. It inspires people to do what? Speak up. Speak up for, Speak God. Up for the gospel. Does it inspire them to go paint a local school? <laughs> no. Does it inspire them to start a program? No. No. It inspires them to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Right. I want us to see that this morning. This, what they were going through, what they were seeing in Paul, caused them to well up in joy and give the gospel. Not go start social programs or try to take over the government or something like that. Political action. It, was, it didn't. Yeah, there wasn't a political action committee that was put together and that kind of stuff. It was a it was a gospel giving ministry that they started. You say missions is not involved in social issues. Am I saying that missions is not involved in social issues? No. You're not saying they always not. I'm not saying that missions is not involved in <laughs> issues. Oh. I'm saying that the first effect of the gospel, it should be the gospel being given is the yeah. first effect. Oh. And that many people want to take this and reverse that. They want to do a social action and then have the gospel come out of that. Mm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that mm -hmm. wasn't what the believers did in Philippi. Mm -hmm. That's not the example we have set for us. Mm -hmm. The gospel can cause social concerns, cause empathy with people who are suffering and want to help them and want to serve them. That's good. We, we carry out that mission. But the first mission of the church is to give the gospel. Give the gospel. Right? Yeah. Any other? So, so why do you think Paul's imprisonment you know, emboldened them. They what they they saw that they didn't kill him outright, so they were. That's a good question. What what was it about Paul's imprisonment that caused them to say, "Let's give the gospel"? You know, I I think when you read this is that, you know, Paul's in prison. That's the worst that could happen. And yet, what he's doing with his ministry, why he's in prison? So they're thinking, you know, look what he's doing while he's in prison. I've got all the freedom I need, and I'm not doing anything. So the worst thing that's gonna happen to me, I go to prison. 
up with Paul's deal for prison. So that's the worst that could happen to me. That's, that would be encouraging. Yeah, that would be encouraging. Does that kind of help answer your question? Any other thoughts about that? Yeah, well, we, we kind of like today, if somebody, somebody were to be, to have terminal cancer, and yet their attitude is to stand up there and say, look, I'm thrilled with what God is doing with my life. I have joy. To give that example, how much more so should we have joy in our life, in our circumstances, which are not as dire? Mm-hmm. And if they were to become so uh, that bad, that we would have confidence that we would also, God would give us joy in that circumstance. Right. So what have we got to be afraid of? Right. And you see how this kind of goes back to what Paul had prayed for them, right? Mm-hmm. He prayed that they would be able to distinguish what were important issues, what were the, the primary issues. And they do that through a knowledge of who? Christ. Of Christ and of God. Of Christ. Right? So this deeper knowledge, this understanding of who God is and what he's doing, then gives them the ability to decide, this is important, this isn't important. I'm in jail, that's not as important as the opportunity. See, that's why we're going with this, <coughs> this theme right here, what Paul's doing for the Philippians, is setting up this this pointing out to them that these are opportunities, not obstacles. It's going to what you're teaching right now. It, it leads us to what Paul says in verses 18 through 20, and even into verse 21 and 22, with to live as Christ and to die as gain for Him. Mm-hmm. And that's really going to be why this was so inspiring to people because they're thinking as Matthias said if he's in prison and he's prizing Christ in his life far above the gifts that's given to him in this life well, what am I doing? this is lame I'm just sitting around and I, mean, I, sh- I shouldn't be like that I should prize Christ like Paul so that's going to be the thing that's going to uh, and be instilled in them. And what a great uh, bridge between what he's been praying for them and what his life is like to die as gain. You know, that kind of thing. So this bridge of showing that example of what he's going through is a great way for Paul to get from point A to C that we can for 20, in verse 21 and further where he's talking about his desire to to be fruitful for their sake and to live and, and that kind of thing. But knowing that being with Christ would be better. So it's a great it's a great way for us to see how we should live our lives in, in spite of what we see as obstacles. obstacles. So we can describe this group that Paul's talking about. There were many of them. They were brethren. They were doing things because of his imprisonment, the example. They were having more courage to speak the word of God. Now there's another group that's identified in the next verse Verse 14, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Verse 15, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, <coughs> but some also from goodwill. So we have another group that's identified in verse 15. But the question comes up, was it a separate group from verse 14, or was it a subset of that group that was mentioned in verse 14? In other words, is this is this verse 14 group verse 14 is this group that's in verse 15 is this is it part of the group or is it is it a separate group out here? He doesn't really say that. It's a really separate group. <laughs> that's a good question. You say he doesn't say. Well, he doesn't it doesn't say. really say, but I think it is the outside people. You think it is this group out here? Yeah. It's separate from. It. I think it's a subgroup. You think it's a subgroup? We go both ways. He talks about most of the brethren. Now, they could be included in the brethren, whereas the ones that are excluded in that could just be ones that weren't basically going out and giving the gospel, that weren't inspired to do so by what his situation or Or they could be the ones that he separated by it. I mean, it could be uh, others that were led to Christ by someone else. They're part of his brethren, but not his children. And so they have their own vain ambitions to be like Paul. Mm -hmm. 
Now, first of all, let's, let's understand what this group is, what, what this group in verse 14 is. We said they were brethren, right? Yeah. Those that are saved, they're trusting <coughs> in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trick calls them brethren. And what is this group in 14 doing? They're being bold, bold about speak the, word speak, God. speak the word of God. Verse 15, some, the way the NASB starts off that verse, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy. Okay, so what's this group in verse 15? Whether we say they're in there or not, what is this group in verse 15 doing? Well, preaching. They're preaching as well. They're preaching as well, yeah. They're doing it out of envy, not in strife, not really out because of the of it. Right. There is a distinction between them. But there, but this group in verse 15 is proclaiming Christ as well, preaching Christ. I think that right there puts them in that. Yeah. And then the word some starts off that verse. It's going to put this group, they're doing the same thing, verse 14 and verse 15. This, that group's doing the same thing. In verse 15, though, we get the word some. Some. And there's really no change in context here for Paul. He's talking about the brethren who are proclaiming. In fact, he pulls in that group and lets you know that it's part of that group by going on and saying that they're preaching Christ out of envy, out of envy and strife. Right? So, the way I see this in verse 14 and 15 is that this is a subset of group 14. Now that's important for us to realize because it brings up a lot of questions. He, verse 14, he says they're brethren. Then he says some of them. So is he saying that this group is unsaved? No. No, they're not heretics. They're not heretics. They sure are acting like it though, aren't they? Yeah. Wrong motives. Wrong motives is what he's saying. They're just jealous because they're not in jail. They're jealous because they're not in jail. Now that's a strong statement, but, you know, it's... Actually, it could be even taken the reverse. They're jealous that Paul is in jail. Hmm. It could be taken that way, too. That, that yeah, that is, I'm glad he's here and I'm not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's definitely a difference between them. But this group in verse 15, I believe it to be part of, part of the larger group out of verse 14. And that we say it in verse 14, most, most. It's not all of the brethren. Not, not everyone that he knows that's a believer has gotten this encouragement to go out and start preaching boldly because of Paul's imprisonment. Most of them have. But within that group, some of that group. Now, don't get caught up in the way I drew the circle because I, I don't know how big this group is. It might be that big. I mean, it's, I don't have any way to tell. I just know that it's a smaller group from the way I read that verse. Some. Okay. So, let's look at the, this group as well and see if we can describe this group. The cause of their preaching was at fault. The cause of their preaching was at fault. We could get into motives like Matthias mentioned here. The word from in verse 15 is how you could be sure of preaching Christ even from. And you can see in the NASB anyway, there's a footnote there with that word from, and it says literally, because of. Because of. They were envious, jealous of Paul. So their preaching was coming out of, or from, or because of this jealousy. Right? And the result of jealousy, or envy, is what? You can see it there in the verse. So to be sure, preaching Christ even from envy. And what's the outworking of that envy? Preaching Christ. Strike. Strike. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they preached Christ because of it, too. How can they be saved and preach out of envy and strife? That's a great question. Yeah. That is a great question. Young Christians are great at that. But I like what it says in verse 16. Okay, so when I first came to know the Lord, mm. you know, I was so, so excited for what happened to me that I started uh, preaching to my actually preaching to my relatives, mm. but I wasn't leaving it. Mm. Something like that? Mm. Did you feel as if your uh, faith had given you some kind of upper hand in life? Um, or I'm or advantage that they didn't have? They didn't have, yeah, something like that. Advantage they didn't yeah. have. No, I, I can see it as, take an example we can use here, let's say Jim is Paul. I know it's a bit of a stretch. Um, 
<laughs> Let's say he's in his position of, of authority over the local church here. Um, he gets paid for what he does. He gets that. Let's say I, as a layman, am out there doing... <laughs> Let's say I, as a layman, I'm out there and I'm, I'm doing essentially the same thing he is. Or even more. Maybe even more. I mean, I'm going out there and I'm working just as hard as he is and I'm doing just as much for, for God. But I've got that bit of envy. He's got the position. He gets paid for what he's doing. And I don't. So, you know, what do you start doing? And it happens mm. in churches everywhere. You start, you know, kind of, you know, backbiting and talking. And, and you have a little bit of jealousy there. And I you got to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's kind of what I, I see in that, is yeah. that they are a little bit jealous of his apostolic authority and his particular gifts that they don't have. They're doing the same thing. It's just sin. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Jim has apostolic authority. I, I said it's a bit of a stretch. It's a huge stretch. He won't. Uh, he doesn't deal in that kind of stuff. No. Well, the result of their jealousy is an outworking of strife. And that's that's you would strife, we understand that. Great. Just mean contention, arguing. You know that the, the physical manifestations of that. Um, in fact, they weren't united. They weren't united. That's right. They weren't united. You know, you see a lot of that in today. Today's church. The one preacher who gets a lot of attention in the media, and they say, well, biblically, it's not correct, and they're back and forth, but, you know, I got it all over my head, so I should be able to do it. You see that actually oh. today? Yeah. Oh, yeah. With all the preachers on TV and everybody. Right, right. A lot of jealousy taking place because mm-hmm. they're getting attention. You got to catch what Matthias was saying is that yeah. he's that a lot, even in today's pastors, especially the ones who are well known, right. either in the media circles or or just the books that they write, that kind of thing. Uh, the number of radio programs or television programs, you <laughs> can see that strife and that that battling back and forth sometimes even between them um, as they try to keep their market, mm-hmm. keep, their, keep their group together. But you see this group and it, you see the strife that it causes and Dr. Gramacki says, envy is the inward emotion whereas strife is the outward expression. And let's turn just to see if this is uh, true to other people. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. I'll start reading uh, for us in verse 1 of chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. For you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. Verse 3, For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? And he goes on to point out that the reason why they're doing that is because they're dividing themselves up and saying, I am of Apollos and I am of Paul. So we see that strife. And and, and Matthias is, is correct. We see that even today churches that continue to go through these these things. And Paul, even then, was saying that, you know, we need to grow up. We need to get out of this. Grow from this. Grow into something else. Another example one commentator gives is this. And, and this really, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, that's so true. The Twelve. Talking about Jesus and the Twelve. The Twelve had argued among themselves about who would be the greatest. Um, yeah. But Christ explained to them that ministry is not about who achieves the greatest prominence, but about rendering slavish service for the sake of the gospel. So see that even among the twelve who were walking and talking and interacting with Jesus, we see that same concept there. That strife and that envy start to to come out in their actions about who would be the most important and who would sit at which position and that kind of stuff. So it can happen to (laughs) believers can happen to believers. My first thing, I, when I read this, I was like, oh, they're not Christians. <laughs> and they can't be Christians. That's, you know, he's talking to some other group. And the more you study it, the more you realize that there is example and there is scripture pointing towards that same occurrence in a church. You see that. You go, oh, well. Paul goes on to say it doesn't really matter what the motive is. Every church split is grounded in that. It's grounded in that. 
The motive is, it, is immaterial. The motive is immaterial, and that's where Paul's headed with this. Now we can see a continued description of this same group. If you'll jump down with me past verse 16, because we're going to pick them up as the second group. But we'll jump down to verse 17 and pick up a couple more descriptions of this group. Verse 17, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So the continued description that we have in verse 17 is that they're doing things out of selfish ambition. This shows us where the envy comes out. It shows it's coming out of, out of envy, out of selfish ambition. So they're, they have a motive behind this that's, that's something they're after, they want. They didn't preach for, from pure motives or, or the footnote it, that you see in the NASB there said not sincerely in that verse. They're not preaching sincerely. These men had the love of their own reputations as their motivation, not a love of Christ. Another way we can describe it was their whole purpose was to cause distress for Paul. That was the whole point of what they were trying to do. They were taking advantage of Paul's imprisonment and try to teach and, and maybe even pull away some of the flock uh, from Paul's teaching. And maybe it was an effort to cause jealousy in Paul. You know, to get Paul riled up that I can't do anything. I'm trapped. i got this guard chained to me. I'm stuck here. Oh, those people upset me so much. Now, Paul, Paul's saying, I'm going to rejoice. So, is it working? Is it making Paul jealous? Is it causing him distress in prison? No, we see it's not. Now, what would have caused <coughs> Paul... You think about this. What would have caused Paul distress and anguish while he sat in prison? False gospel. False gospel. Yeah. Galatians. He's all, what are you people doing? You've turned so quickly already from the true gospel, the one gospel. There is only one gospel. So if these people really want to get Paul upset, what should they have done? They should have left sound teaching and got off and started teaching heresy. They should have started talking about religious rules and rights and regulations, and they should have started saying that Jesus isn't the only person that has a way to get to heaven to be found right with God. They should have started going off and, and leaving doctrine, but they weren't. And so Paul's like, eh, that doesn't bother me at all. I'm, you know, who cares? I shouldn't Man. care. They're, They're preaching Christ. Christ. Yeah, God will deal with their exactly, motives. Exactly, their motives. Interesting, isn't it? That's the way, if you want to get under Paul's skin, you start going off and leaving the doctrine, preaching another way. So we see another way that they're doing is not sincerely, and they're trying to cause Paul distress. And verse 18 now contains probably the last of their description. Maybe not in the whole book of Philippians, but just in this section. The last of their description. Uh, verse 18, What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now, you might not have said, well, that doesn't describe that group. But it really does, because Paul's saying, if they're preaching out of pretense, so it's another description of this group. They proclaimed in pretense. And we can uh, see this same word is used in Acts 27, verse 30. We don't have to turn there. Actually, yeah, let's turn there. What is it? We've got time. Acts 27, verse 30. For this same word, this pretense that they're preaching out of, Sailors, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. And as the sailors were trying to escape.